I was the only child of Ben and Carla Irving. They had always been under the impression that they could not have kids, they had tried for years, so when mom fell pregnant it came as a shock to both of them. Dad was a fireman. He didn't socialize with the other guys at the station outside of work. He was obsessed with weightlifting, he ate beef, almonds, and chugged a pint of milk every four hours. Even through the night, he would set his alarm clock to go off every four hours so that he could get up and eat. He was 5 feet 9 inches and eventually began to look as wide as he was tall, like a human square. He lifted twice a day, once before work and once after. Mom was a music teacher at my primary school, she enjoyed her job and was a natural born optimist. I could see the change in dad over the years, he simply became more and more withdrawn, I was 13 and reaching an age where I was able to identify problems. It started with him having an inability to go to the shops, when I questioned him about it, he simply replied I don't need people effing staring at me, so I just went to the shop for him. He and mom talked less and less as the years went by, then S started getting really weird, he refused to let us have any TVs or radios on in the house, no computer games, nothing. I could hear him and mom arguing but could never make out the specifics. It was something about things getting in the way. Mom came to me while he was in work one day and said, you know that your dad is not well right, so we are going to have to move out and he is going to have to get some help. What kind of help? I asked. He is going to need a psychiatrist, she said, do you know what a psychiatrist is? Yes, they get people to lie down on coaches and talk to them about their lives, I said. No that's a psychologist, I think what your dad is going to need is a psychiatrist, it's a doctor who can give him medication to help his mind. I don't think she had any intention of going back to him, it was just the right thing to say at the time. We are going to stay at Linda's house until he gets better, she said. Linda was an art teacher at the school and mom's best friend. But it was too late, the next day, dad went up to the school and beat the s out of Mr. McCarthy, the head of music. He had a paranoid delusion that my mom had been cheating on him, based on seeing them laughing and joking together at a party, he actually walked into the classroom where he was teaching and beat him half to death. I was told he hit to the floor and then continued to hit him so hard while he was on the floor that his head was bouncing off the floor like a basketball. He was arrested while walking to his car at the school car park. At the court hearing, forensic psychiatrists said that my dad suffered from a number psychotic mental disorders, they placed him in a maximum security psychiatric facility and I knew I would never see him outside again. I cried so much after the trial that I felt like I was going to dehydrate, but the next day I woke up and felt like a different person, I felt mentally stronger, like when a bruise heals and the skin comes back tougher, that's how my mind felt. I started to have contempt for people who cried or even moaned about their s tie situations, like a breakup or a rejection, I would think to myself, how dare you cry, you don't even know what pain is. I would even ridicule them. In a really messed up way, I didn't feel any shame or embarrassment about what my dad did, I kind of liked the attention it brought me in school, it made me seem interesting. My mom, never spoke about it after the trial, she was a solid optimist like that, she saw no need to dwell on the situation. Instead of moving to Linda's house, Linda moved in with us. Two years after the incident with dad, was when I met Carrie, it was the summer holidays. I'd heard that when you grew up life moves faster because your brain is already familiar with life, you're not learning as much, you're taking the same routes to work, doing basically the same thing over, and over again playing a trick on the working memory as opposed to when you're young and experiencing new things it makes time last longer. I was on a bus heading towards town to see some friends, each day was the same routine, find an abandoned building, play run out until that got boring. Then we would climb into a ventilation shaft while one of us, always the youngest, would have to go to the phone box across the road and phone the police. 
We would crack jokes and do impressions until we could actually see the police inside the abandoned warehouse. We would stare at them through the cracks in the shaft and try not to laugh. Then in the evening we would tell our parents we were going to sleep at each other's houses, mainly because it was scary. We would drink cider, and smoke a small amount of weed. It was a happy time. It got even happier when one day I was catching a bus down to town when I saw Carrie, I always caught the 1120 butt, and I guess she was a stickler for routine because, she always walked her white Labrador dog Jimmy at that time. I thought what have I got to lose, I asked the driver to pull over, and ran over to her, just started walking by her side. Hi, I said. Hi. I'm Carrie, I recognize you. Yes I think you're in the other side of my year at school. We are both saying obvious things at this point, we were just not experienced enough in these type of situations. I'm kind of known for my dad being crazy and nearly killing the head of music Mr. McCarthy. Yes I remember that, she said, what happened to him after that? He got locked away in a secure unit, I haven't seen him since. Do you miss him? Not really, I try not to think about it. Because it will make you sad. Yeah I guess. I had to change the subject because it just seemed so downbeat. What's your dog's name? Jimmy, S name isn't it? My parents called him that, I would have called him something cool, like, Bruno. Like the boxer, Frank Bruno. I said but he doesn't even look, slightly intimidating. He is effing wild, he has a twin brother named Luke who is completely chilled out but he has bitten four people and it's only because they took sympathy on me for crying, he has definitely one bite away from the death penalty. Ain't you scared of him? I said. No, we grew up together, he would never try and hurt me, when I was a kid I would sit on my staircase and talk to him for hours, he would start licking me like he knew what I was saying. But he is gone in the head, sometimes he just flips out and bites people. I looked at him and could kind of see the potential in him, maybe he was like my dad, maybe she should not be so trusting of him. We kept walking until we came to some swings and took a seat. Me and Carrie became boyfriend and girlfriend after that day, every morning I would wait at the bottom of her lane and we would walk to school holding hands, and when school finished we would walk home. We talked about music, movies, and other things relating. She was easy to be around. Carrie's family had a nice little house in a nice area, her dad worked security at a local oil refinery at nights, while her mum ran a small clothes shop in town. Carrie had a little brother called Charlie, it's kind of hard to know what he had wrong with him specifically, the doctors were not able to make a formal diagnosis. He spent the majority of his time in his room listening to music, but only the first 30 seconds of each song. One day me and Carrie were playing tennis in her garden, no net. Just trying to keep the ball up in the air, we were trying to challenge each other more and more by hitting the ball further and further. Carrie ran in front of Bruno and must have startled him, because he jumped up and bit her hard on the forearm, before retreating back into an aggressive stance, she immediately burst into tears and I hugged her tight, I assumed she was crying from a combination of the pain and the shock of being bitten. My dad is going to put him down for sure, we need to make a story up quick, she said. Don't worry about that, we need to get you to a hospital quick, it might be infected, I said. I hugged her tighter, and then suddenly felt a sharp pain in my arm like multiple tiny little knives stabbing deep into my skin, confused, I let go of her and rolled up my left sleeve and watched as my skin tore apart. Carrie started along with me in disbelief and put her left forearm alongside mine, and in perfect synchronicity my skin tore apart to create the appearance of her bite, while her arm healed up as if, it had never happened. We both paused in disbelief, I was so astonished that the pain did not register. Carrie broke the silence. What the F? I don't know, I replied. Quickly get in the kitchen. Back in the house she poured antiseptic on it and bandaged like a pro, without a single mention of a hospital visit, 
which led me to question whether she valued Bruno's life over mine for just a minute. John you're like a superhero, I always knew there was something special about you. Maybe it's a curse, I said. But you took my pain away, so you're a hero to someone in this room, she said. I know, I did not mean it like that. I wonder if you can do it again, if it was just some crazy one-off miracle, we paused and made eye contact, maybe you could test it again. Yes sure, does your dad still have that chainsaw in the shed, I joked. Baby steps, we can regrow some limbs later this afternoon, let's start small for now. She went in the kitchen drawer and produced a small pin, she extended her finger out toward me, facing upwards, she pricked her finger and and grimaced, a perfect circle of blood appeared at the tip of her finger. She took my hand and extended my finger next to hers. Yet again, in perfect unison, the circle of blood retracted back into her finger while simultaneously appearing in the same place on my Ouch, I said embarrassingly, realizing I had the lower tolerance for pain out of the two of us. That's the craziest thing, I have ever seen, she said, I wonder if it works when we are not touching. She took her hand away from my arm and pricked her middle finger with the same intensity again. If love was not so blind I would probably have become frustrated at the idea of being used as a remote pin cushion. She grimaced yet again and we stared at our two fingers, but this time, nothing appeared on mine. It's touch, it only works on people you are in contact with, I wonder if it only works on people you love. She said kissing me on the forehead. The next few weeks did not go well, I was plagued with illness, colds, flus, you name it. Mom was starting to believe that I was faking it. But there was no way she could deny that I had a hot temperature. So she had to allow me the time off. Carrie would come round to visit, bringing treats for me. It's not cool, I said, it's far from cool. What do you mean, you're like a superhero? Nah. It's super curse, every person I come into contact with, I contract what they have, I take it from them. You believe that? I know that. I know it. So what are you going to do? I'm not going back to school. Truant officer is going to come round and force you eventually. The more ill I get, the more they going to suspect something is different about me, next thing they going to be running tests on me, then the government going to lock me away and run tests on me for the rest of my life. You reckon they will show up in radioactive suits, looking for you like E.T., she smiles. That's exactly what I think is going to happen. So how are you going to get around not going to school? I've been reading up on homeschooling, my mom gets me a tutor, and I can stay here. Why would she do that? I'm going to tell her, I have this thing called agoraphobia. What is that? It's a fear of the outside world, I got a book from the library and read all about it, I reckon I could fake it to the doc. Are you faking though, because it sounds like you are afraid of the outside world. Maybe I have a good reason, would you want to be sick all the time? No, I'm just saying. Anyway, let's change the subject. Let's stick a movie on, how about Goodfellas? I want Scarface. Eventually I just outright refused to go to school, to even leave the house. Mom had to smooth things over with the school while she waited for a referral for a shrink. He finally arrived, a tall guy with grey hair to match his skin. Mom left him and me in the living room and he pulled out a pen and pad and began to ask me questions. Okay. So your mum is telling me that you don't enjoy leaving your home anymore, what was it that brought this on, he said. Everything was great until, I stopped being able to leave my house. Every time I walk out the door my heart beats so fast it feels like it's going to explode out of my chest. He scribbles on his notepad. Twenty something questions later and I have a prescription a regular appointment with a therapist and advice to my mother from the psychologist that I should be homeschooled. I felt guilty about putting my mum through all of this, but the reality was that it was not my fault. She did a good job of hiding how she felt about the situation. 
The tutor came daily and the schedule was pretty close to school. She was a young cool tutor and every now and then I would try and change the subject onto something that was not connected to education, because I was not getting the social fix of school, she obliged my now and then, even told me a crazy story about her and her friends doing a Ouija board and contacting an unborn baby who passed away in utero. It was such a bizarre story from someone who seemed so normal, bizarre to the point that I believed her, at least I believed that she believed it happened, it's not like I had not had my own share of crazy experiences. The truth is that it was kind of risky for her to tell me that, as my mom would have hit the roof if she had found out about that, but not as much as when I had gained her trust and she told me that her favorite hobby was taking pot brownies and surfing and how the majority of the money she made from tutoring went on seeing live music. I guess even tutors need a social fix, no matter how much she shared I never told her my secret, the temptation was there, it reminded me of how I like to tell people about my dad's story, it made me seem interesting and I really wanted her to find me interesting but the stakes were too high. Every now and then she would ask about my agoraphobia and lying about symptoms I had read in a book made me feel hollow, but I had no other choice. Carrie visited after school every night, we sat around listening to music, we were currently at our grunge phase, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden we were about to transition into our hip hop phase, Tupac, NAS, and Dr. Dre, we had a consistent love of corny pop music throughout. We liked movies so she would pick up a VHS from the store on the way over. Our favorites being comedies and gangster flicks. I was happy for a while until I began to feel as if I was wasting her life and that she would have a much better quality of life without me. So I told her I did not want to see her anymore. I made her promise that she would not tell anybody and she promised, she looked sad but I think she really wanted to save face so made every effort not to look upset. After the tutoring was over I would find myself getting more, and more bored in the evenings, I tried watching movies by myself but it did not have the same effect. I enjoyed listening to the music but it was sad having nobody to discuss it with afterwards. Drawing became my thing. I would steal my sister's magazines and find the most attractive model in there, and then work on drawing her. I longed for the company of a beautiful female again and by sketching the women it was like a way to meditate on beauty, a way to feel intimacy. Stacy would come round to do tutoring and I would just continue sketching. It came to the point where I had become completely despondent. Just focusing in my sketching refusing to look up and interact. She spoke to my mum about how things were simply just not working out anymore and maybe a different tutor would be a better idea. But my mom plead with her to continue her work. At age 17, my sister got pregnant, she had been with her boyfriend for about 6 months, it was just more stress for my mum in her ongoing world of stress, I had now become a full hermit, living in my bedroom completely refusing to interact with the outside world, just constantly drawing. My mum had read a lot of literature and was now convinced that I had Asperger's syndrome. She spent the next few months giving my sister as much support as she could. It was helpful that I no longer asked for anything and instead only left my room to make a small snack. The months flew by and before we all knew it Teresa, her boyfriend, and mom went to the hospital. Their baby was born with no initial problems but the complications arrived shortly after the baby who was still unnamed, had a severe case of whooping cough, which the doctors had to acknowledge could be fatal. My mom arrived home looking as if she had not slept for three days straight went to the fridge to make herself a sandwich. I stood in the doorway of the kitchen. How is she? Things could be a lot better, she replied while still rummaging in the fridge, is there any bread here? Sorry, I had the last piece. Can you imagine how much easier life could be at a time like this, if you were capable of going to the shops and collecting some food to stock up on, or maybe taking some of our laundry to be done? or going to the hospital and giving your sister a hug which could help her feel a little bit better, 
while she is dealing with her own problems like the fact she is very likely to lose her baby. You know I can't. Can't you, how about trying? I felt so much anger seething through my body, did she think I liked living this f ed up life? Could this be described as a quality life? I was eating toast and threw the plate at the wall full force. A silence sat between us and it became apparent I hated myself but was too weak to even utter those words. Mum looked at me with contempt and I took her stare as if I was being stoic. I then ran to my room gently closed the door and climbed under the cover. It was here that it dawned on me that it would be the best thing for everybody if I killed myself and maybe I could save my sister's baby in the process, and do one good thing on my way out the door. So I waited until I could hear that mom had gone out and then ran out the door and made my way to the nearest bus. The outside world felt like a crazy place, senses were on overload, the brightness, the smells, the sounds, everything felt super intense, so I focused on my breathing waiting for it to all go away. I remember reading in a self-help book, that if you focus on your feeling of anxiety, what it feels like, the speeded up heart rate, the sweaty palms, then eventually it will start to go away. The point being that the observer cannot be the experience. I tried this method in opposition to the breathing method and noticed my anxiety was starting to feel bearable. I was not long before I was at the hospital, as I walked through the great big doors it became apparent I was surrounded by ailments, broken limbs, pathogens. As tense as my body was I was pleased with how I managed to avoid brushing past any people. I chose to take the stairs instead of risking somebody walking into my elevator at the last minute. The signs were well placed and I could feel myself en route to the pediatric health unit. Before I knew I was there, I walked up and down the ward peeking through curtains, at concerned looking families. Until I found them, it was mom and Liz with little baby Jason, Tom what are you doing here, mom said. I just wanted to see the little man, it had taken Liz a moment to overcome her shock before commenting that, I think he likes you, he has not seemed that calm for a long time now. I knew that my time spent with him had been enough to absorb his whooping cough. I'm sorry but I'm not going to be able to stay, I said as I passed little Jason back to Liz. Everything is going to be okay now, Jason is going to get better, I can't explain any more than that but I need you to promise me that you will never speak of me being here today, anyway I'm sorry. I have to go. I walked out briskly and could feel the onset of the symptoms. I made it through the hospital onto the bus and back home to the safety of my bed covers. The symptoms were in full effect by now. Two hours later, mom arrived, I could tell her mood was elated from seeing recovery that little Jason had made, but then she observed that my covers were soaked through and it was apparent. I was not well. My breathing was labored, no hospital mom. She placed her hand on my head and said, are you crazy, you're burning up. Mom you can do whatever you want but no hospital. She must have phoned our family doctor, Dr. Oswald. I could hear her shouting and pleading. Then an hour later he was at the house prescribing the strongest dose of antibiotics available. Few weeks later. I was feeling completely normal. I had a promise from mum and Liz never to speak about the day and a plan for my future. Hope you enjoyed. Consider subscribing. Faceless. Voiceless.